determination of solution concentration via titration. We determined solution concentration via spectrophotometry in the past. Let's do it a different way. Instead of looking at the color of a solution, we can carefully react a solution of something that we know what it is, with a so, but we don't know its concentration, with a solution of something that we also know what it is, and we do know its concentration. And as long as we know the reaction between our unknown concentration thing and our known concentration thing, we can determine the concentration of our unknown thing. Uh, we can determine the concentration of our unknown concentration thing. So like with experiment 11, when we did it spectrophotometrically, we need to determine the concentration of something because oftentimes the dose makes the poison. And like in experiment 12, where we found the pH of acids and bases, the thing that we're finding the concentration of in this lab is a acid or a base. And it can be determined chemically using an indicator. And we're going to do that just like we would do if we were testing the uh, concentration of chemicals in a pool uh, kit. If you ever worked at a swimming pool or had a swimming pool or known somebody that's owned a swimming pool, they got to test it to make sure that the right levels of chemicals are in there so it doesn't burn your eyes and it doesn't grow bacteria. So we saw in the past the type of reaction known as a double displacement or a double replacement reaction where we pretty much swap halves, right? A goes with the anion over here, D. C goes with the anion over here, B. And we form two new compounds. If we do this between an acid and a base, we get a salt, not table salt in this case, potassium chloride, and water instead of sodium chloride if we had NaOH here. We're using um, Drano instead of easy off oven cleaner, okay? So, depending on how soluble your salt is, you may get a precipitate or not. But certainly we are doing a neutralization reaction. We're reacting an acid with a base and ending up with a salt, which is neutral, still an electrolyte if it's soluble, and water. So what does HCl aqueous mean? When we talked about net ionic equations, we said that a strong acid or a strong base would fully ionize in solution. So it's really H plus and Cl minus. Ditto for KOH. It's really K plus and OH minus. And so we have the H plus and the Cl minus and the K plus and the OH minus floating around in solution. And when they rearrange in a different way, they get this non-electrolyte, non-ionizing water. Here is the full ionic equation, which is back to a chapter four topic for that equation. Notice that the K plus doesn't change. The Cl minus doesn't change. Those are spectator ions. We can do this with NaOH and have no impact on the equation. We can do this with HBr and have no impact on the overall equation. Because what's really happening is H plus is getting together with OH minus and forming water. That is the net ionic equation. K plus and Cl minus are unchanged. They are spectator ions. They are not part of the net ionic equation, which only shows the things undergoing change. The H plus and the OH minus forming water. So a titration is doing that kind of a reaction. You can do a redox titration. You can do a precipitation titration. There are a lot of other uh, types of titrations that we can do with known reactions. We are doing an acid-base titration by carefully reacting acid and base together until we find that the reaction is exactly completed. The dilution equation works because moles per liter times liters equals moles and moles equals moles. It's unchanged during a dilution because all we're adding is solvent. We can also do this with acids and bases or precipitation or any other kind of titration so long as we know the ratio between moles of component number one and moles of component number two, which is given by our 
chemical equation. In our case, our acid and our base are going to react one to one. So we don't really need to worry about any difference between the number of moles of each because the number of moles is the same. It's one in each case. Sometimes your salt may precipitate. Sometimes your ratio may not be one to one. So all of those things have to be accounted for. In our lab, we're finding the molarity of acetic acid in vinegar. Vinegar is known to be a roughly 5% by mass solution of acetic acid in water. And this lab will confirm that and it works really, really well. So here we have our titration equation, which is pretty much just a adapted version, a changed version of the dilution equation, taking into account the fact that we might or might not have a one to one ratio. And strictly speaking, molarity times volume of acid, moles of acid, doesn't necessarily equal moles of base. By throwing this fraction in there, it does equal moles of acid on both sides, right? Molarity moles per liter of base times volume of base in liters would give us moles of base. Moles of base here would cancel with moles of base there and give us moles of acid. Molarity of acid times volume of acid gives us moles of acid. Moles of acid equals moles of acid. Now, writing it this way is confusing for some people. It's equivalently written this way. It's going to give us the same thing, right? If we had two H's, it would require two moles of base. And so this way is still going to give us the same thing down here. But um, this is clearer for some people. So I give it to you both ways. Number of H pluses in your acid times the molarity acid times the volume of acid equals the number of OH's in the base. So if you had NaOH versus, say, CaOH2, CaOH2 would have two OH's. So you'd put a two there. Molarity base times volume of base. All of this says that every single H plus that's present reacts with an OH minus. And once every single H plus has reacted with OH minus, we are at neutrality, pH seven. How can we figure, well, pH seven, depending on what salt is involved technically. But for us, we mix a strong acid with a strong base, we should end up with a neutral pH seven solution. How can we figure out when that happens? Just like in the last lab, we will use an indicator. So we're going to take our titration, which is of a known molarity base, and add it carefully to a unknown concentration of acid. We know what the acid is. It's acetic acid because we're going to throw some vinegar in there. And we also have to make sure that we add our indicator, just a drop or two, because indicators our acids are bases themselves. And so if you use more than a drop or two of indicator, you're gonna change the pH of the solution. I know in the pH lab, we scored it in a whole bunch of Yamada's indicator. Uh, that Yamada's indicator was pretty dilute. So we got away with it. We're looking for a color change. In acid, phenolphthalein, the indicator that we use is clear and colorless. In base, phenolphthalein is clear but pink. So if we add base and there's still extra acid down here that hasn't all reacted with the base yet, it's going to stay colorless. I'm going to add more base, still colorless. Add more base, still colorless. Add more base till one extra OH minus comes out of this, uh, this uh, burette. And there, it's left over down here. It's reacted with all, all the H pluses are gone. Every single H plus down here is reacted with an OH minus up here. We get one more OH minus down here. Boom, color change, pink. That's what we're looking for. And that's the challenge in this experiment is to add the base very, very, very carefully until you get just the lightest shade of pink possible. So we do it into a flask so that it doesn't splash so instead of a beaker. We got to very, very, very carefully read our meniscuses, menisci, whatever the plural of meniscus is. Sometimes that's helped by putting a piece of paper with a line on it behind your burette so that you can see that, oh, this isn't exactly on the line, it's slightly above it. And notice this goes 10, 
10.1, 10.2, 10.3, 10.4, 10.5, bigger line, 10.6, 7, 8, 9, 11. 11.1, 11.2, 11.3. It's between 11.2 and 11.3. You have to guess the last digit. If we just write down 11.2, whoever is reading our data sheet thinks, oh, it was between 11 and 12, but it was closer to 11. That's not good enough. It's definitely between 11.2 and 11.3. We have to guess the extra digit so that we have the correct number of, of significant digits, the correct level of precision for this burette. Sometimes what you're titrating it with is a solid, and so you just weigh it to determine the number of moles. You don't have to do molarity times volume to get number of moles. You can just weigh it and get grams to moles. Regardless, we have to know the identity of everything involved in our equation because we have to know the equation. We have to be able to know how many moles of reactant 1 reacts with however number of moles of reactant 2. So here's a question for you. So things to think about in the lab. You have to rinse any drops of base stuck to the sides of the flask down into the solution. Adding extra water doesn't matter. How come? Because you're not messing with the amount of solute. You're only adding extra solvent, and solvent doesn't participate in the reaction. You need to make sure that you understand whatever version of that titration equation you use, why it works. Remember that molarity times volume equals number of moles. And we're doing a titration, we're doing a reaction. The number of moles of reactant 1 may not be the same as the number of moles of reactant 2, depending on the equation involved. Things to think about theoretically, if we want to explain some error. There won't be much error in this lab. It works very, very, very well. But think about what happens when carbon dioxide from the air dissolves in water. We mentioned this in the pH lab. You get carbonic acid. So if you leave your solutions out long enough, carbon dioxide is going to dissolve in them and it's going to make the solution more acidic. If you add too much base and you get a dark pink indicated solution instead of a light pink, how does that impact the amount of acid that is apparently in your solution instead of the amount of acid that's actually in your solution? What if the base doesn't actually go into the flask, if it sticks to the side of the flask or if you spill it outside the flask and you keep going until it turns pink? but not all of the base went into the solution. What's that going to do to your apparent concentration of acid? I leave you to discuss this further with your instructor. I hope you enjoy the lab.